Ah, amen. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, Jess. Praise God. I have been on a series, and I'm getting ready to wrap it up. Uh, I might have one more week. I might not. We'll just see what I get out today. We've been talking about advancing the kingdom of God. And that is our job, and that is our primary purpose. Amen? As Christians, it's mine as a pastor. I have, <laughs> oh boy. No, no, I'm not, no. You know, as a pastor, people want you to be involved in all kinds of things. They all have their opinion on what you need to be pushing and majoring on. And, and you ought to be saying this and you ought to be doing that. And you ought to, you know, addressing this. And, and, and it's, it's, it's constant. It's all the time. You know, uh, with, with everything that's going on with, with this, the, the, the COVID, you know, I have people that are saying, you don't need to be having church at all. And I got other people seriously telling me you ought to fill in every row and pack the house. So I, I get them from both sides. And, and I've decided, you know what, I need to be led by the Holy Ghost and just do what the Holy Spirit's telling me to do. That's why we opened up five weeks ago. I know the, 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 the president, thank God, came out and deemed us essential, but I deemed myself essential five weeks ago. And uh, decided to go ahead and have church. Praise God. And as far as I can tell, as far as I know, no one's got the disease yet. Praise the Lord. So it, 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 was, a, it was a decision led by the Lord. Another thing is that the people are, are pastors are pressured on this. You need to address the political situation. We need to be more involved in politics. We need to be involved in all these things. And I, you know, when it comes around election time, I'll usually say something. But you know, I'm not anointed for politics. That's, that's not where my anointing is. And if you're watching and it's yours, power to you, go out and preach away. My anointing is to preach the kingdom of God. And Jesus Christ, and to lift him up and spread the kingdom. Well, are you worried, not worried about people going to steal our rights? I, you know, I am and I'm not. You know, uh, I'll say some things about it, but the only way we're going to change it is at the ballot box, not with a gun. I have no desire to shoot anybody. I own a lot of guns. Don't come to my house. I own a lot of guns. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> but, but, but I'm not itching to use it on people. I don't want to ever in my life, you know? Uh, so praise God. So I'm preaching about advancing the kingdom of God. And that's what this message has been about. That's, that's, my call. And I believe that is the call of most Christians. We're, we're to advance his kingdom here in the earth. So we've been looking at that for a number of weeks, praise God. Probably had more people click off now, you know, but because I won't jump on their bandwagon. But praise God. Uh, you know, what we've been looking at the last couple messages is if we are going to ever be serious about this whole advancing the kingdom of God and telling people about Jesus and, and manifesting that, is that we're going to have to tap into the love of God. The love of God. Because God loves people. God loves people when we talked about this last week, if we could ever come to know and understand 
the absolute love that God has for us as people. It, it changes us even as Christians. We've been saved by that love, but we struggle sometimes to understand that love. Amen? We have to understand the depth of that love. That's why the Holy Spirit was praying through Paul. And he was saying, man, I pray that you might come to know, to understand what is the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of that love of God. So that because until you know that love and can experience that love for yourself and then start manifesting that love, you know, that, that's in you. You're never going to really get out of your comfort zone to reach the lost because you won't understand. I mean, you're not walking in the love that God has for the lost. You have to understand, you know, sometimes we allow ourselves to be as Christians, especially if we've been a Christian for a long time. You know what a lot of times we can slip over into if we're not careful? We're irritated by the lost. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like uh, if somebody, you know, I'm sure if I could have you raise hands, there's a lot of people in here. You used to smoke cigarettes <laughs> or the other, you know, and you used to smoke. And, and now you quit. And being around people that smoke now, it, it just irritates you. I'm that way with, with drunks, because I used to be a drunk. And when I'm around a drunk, it irritates me, because I think it reminds me of, of what a fool I used to be. And I see how they act, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I acted like that. But, but God's not irritated. God's full of love. God's full of compassion. God loved me when I was the biggest fool in the world. He loved me. He never quit loving me. He never quit reaching out to me. He never quit. He, he never stopped sending people across my path to, to see to it that his, that his love was exposed to me so that I could come out of a place of darkness and into the kingdom of the light of his son. And that's what he wants. So he wants us to understand this love. It, it, it compels him to manifest himself in every way possible. It compelled him to absolutely give everything that he had. He gave his son so that we could come. He gave his love. He gave his spirit. He gave his power. He manifested himself in every way that he possibly could to reach the lost. The sinner, the despicable, the disgusting. <laughs> That's, that was his goal. That was his heart. That's what he wanted to do. And that love caused him to, to sin the absolute best that he had. And it also, what it did was it, 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 it caused him to use everything available to... He sent his son, but he didn't send his son unequipped. You know, a lot of times people say, well, Jesus was the son of God, and they believe that. But they think that he did the things that he did on this earth just because he was the son of God. But the Bible very clearly states to us that when he came, he laid aside his deity, his power, his ability as God, and he became a man because if he wouldn't have become just a man, he would have been unqualified to die for the sins of man. So he didn't have that ability, but what God did do is when he was baptized in the river Jordan, he put his spirit upon him. And we see that in, the, in the, the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke in chapter 3, that when John baptized him, he came up out of the water, it says he was baptized. The Holy Spirit descended and came upon him. And when that Spirit of God came upon him, what it did was it anointed him. And 
you know, and there's a lot of, I mean, the anointing, that word anointing is just a, it's a really big word. It's kind of like a grace word. What it means is basically in a, in a nutshell, he was empowered, smeared with the power of God, rubbed all over with the power of God. And it says, and when he went into the desert and he prayed and he fasted for 40 days, he came out of the desert. It says he returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then after he received the power of the Holy Spirit at, at somewhere around 30 years of age, he said this in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Amen. So that anointing, that power of God came upon him. And when that power came on Jesus, then at that point he was enabled, enabled, if you will, to uh, operate in the fullness of the power that God had available to him to begin to cause the blind to see, to begin to cause the deaf to hear, to begin to cause the lepers to be cleansed, to begin to raise the dead, to begin to do these mighty, wonderful works of God. He didn't do any of that before then. But God equipped him. Why? So he could go out and spread the kingdom of God by whatever means were necessary. See, this is, this is it. We have to understand. God did not anoint Jesus with this miracle working power so he could go around and cause the blind to see, the deaf hear, the lame to walk, and all this stuff. He didn't do that. He did it so that, that the power of God, when manifest was an exposure of the love of God for the lost person. And so that it could penetrate the darkness of men's heart and cause them to see God's love. And he was willing to do whatever it took. You know, everybody's different. Everybody in this room, I could ask you your testimony. What got you saved? What caused you to, to come out of the kingdom of darkness and over into the kingdom of the son of his love? What, what was it that triggered it for you? Some of it, some, you just heard the preaching of the word. And, and there's a great anointing just on the word. And you heard it and you said, boom, bum, man, that's what I've been meaning to hear all my life. Others, you know, you, somebody was teaching the word of God under the anointing of God. And they explained things because you're more of an analytical type person and you needed to understand. And once you understood, once that light come on, you said, "Woo! praise God, that's it, that's it, that's what I've been looking for, that's for me. Others, they hear, they, they hear preaching, they hear teaching, but it wasn't until they were touched by the power of God or somebody they love was touched by the power of God that they saw the love of God exposed in their life. And see, Jesus doesn't have a problem with that. That's why in the Gospel of John chapter 10, he made this statement in verse 25 and then again in verses 37 and 38 uh, along these lines and again in, in, in uh, John chapter 5. He said, listen, you may not believe me, I'm paraphrasing here, you may not believe me because of what I preach and what I teach, but at least believe me because of the works that I'm doing. The works, the power, the manifesting of the power. You know, believe me because of the manifesting of God's power, praise God. Now, we see that, 
And we understand that. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians see, at this point, Christians say, yeah, I, I, I get it, but that was Jesus. And, and that's where it stops. And so many, so many through, through the church in times past and even today, they think that that was just something that was available for Jesus and for, for him and the ministry that he had. They don't understand that that power and that anointing is still available to us today. And it was never God's plan to stop with Jesus. You know, it amazes me that people all through the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament, the power of God was manifest to show forth the love of God. Amen? All through the ministry of Jesus, the power of God was manifest to show forth the love of God. Why do we think that all of a sudden it just stopped? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is still causing the blind to see, the lame to walk the deaf to hear, the lepers to be cleansed, COVID patients to be healed. He's still doing these things. Why? He didn't quit loving humanity. <laughs> this world's still full of people that don't know him. Did he, did, did he quit loving us? Did he quit loving the world? Did, did, he, just, did he just empty out half of his toolbox? You know, I mean, here, here's the greatest project that God's ever undertaken is for us to go out into all the world and preach the gospel and cause people to come to him. Did he send us out with a half, half full toolbox? You know, Jesus had a full toolbox. I mean, it was, I mean, he had everything he needed, but I'm not giving you all that. I'm going to take your hammer and your screwdrivers and I'll leave you a pair of pliers and some baling wire. Which, if you're from Oklahoma, that's perfect. Praise God. But, you know, I mean, the rest of us, you know, we, we need something. Praise the Lord. We, we need this help, and he left it for us. Because this world's a dark, dark place. It's a dark place. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Deep darkness will be on people. Man, I mean, just watch the news. Deep darkness is upon people. That's why he said, I've called you to be a light. And quit hiding your light. Quit hiding the light that I've given to you. Now we see this in the book of Ephesians. Remember last week, uh, we were talking about this love of God. I, I talked about it earlier. God was praying through Paul. I pray, man, he's pleading that you would come to know this love of God. Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul was praying another time. And he said this in verse 19, or 15, he goes, now 16. I, do, I don't cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in, in my prayers. And then he prayed three different things. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He's wanting you to understand, to have revelation in the knowledge of who he is, number one. Number two, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what the hope of his calling is and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You know, what is the hope of his calling? His calling is to reach the world, to manifest the kingdom to the world. That's his calling. People always say, I want to know what my calling is. Your calling's his calling because he's the head, you're the body. You don't have a different calling than he does. You just you need to find out what your part of that calling is. 
but it's not a different calling. Glory to God. Amen. And then in verse 19, this is, listen, read this in this manner. God's pleading through Paul in prayer. I pray that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards, the Amplified says, in us and through us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also which is in the age to come. And he's put all things under his feet. He's saying, man, he, so Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus because the church at Ephesus had the same problem that the church in America has. They don't know what this power is that's in us and should be working through us. And he's praying, my God, I pray that you would know this power that's in you, this power that should be working through you. And you say, well, I, I know. No, we don't. Not to the degree that we should. Some have more of a revelation than others, but none of us have the revelation, that, the fullness of the revelation that we need yet. And so we need to keep praying. He's like, come on, man, don't you understand? This is in you, this is in you, this is in you, this is in you. See, Jesus never wanted this to stop with him. That's why you see in Luke chapter 9, I'm not going to turn there, but Luke chapter 9, it talks about, you know, the 12. He sent the 12 out, and he anointed them. He gave them power over sickness and disease and, and over demons and stuff. And he said, now you guys go. Do what I'm doing. And they did. And they came back, and they're like, whoo, that was, that was awesome. Praise God. Who knew? You know, and a couple of weeks later or however much later there, you know, Jesus had more than 12 disciples. Did you know that? All right. You know, later there were 70 more and they're, they're, they're with him. And he says, man, that, that works so great with the 12. I'm sending out 70 of you, 35 teams. And you do the same thing. You heal the sick, you cast out demons, you do this. Uh, you go. Why? What was he doing? He was trying to show them, this doesn't start and, start and stop with me. This is, and, and this isn't just for the 12 disciples. It's for the multitudes. It's for all of his followers. And then when he got ready to leave the earth, you know, he died, he was resurrected, he spent 40 days here on the earth. And on his way out of town, getting ready to go up into heaven, he, he made some statements. You see this, first of all, over in Mark chapter 16. This is all part of everything that he said right at the end. He said in verse, Mark 16, verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. And these fine signs will follow those who believe. The margin of my Bible says these signs will follow those who have believed in the name, in my name. Now, how many of you have believed in Christ Jesus? Okay. Then these signs are supposed to follow you. You're supposed to lay hands on the sick. You're supposed to cast out demons. You're supposed to do these things. Praise God. He, he also said this. This is recorded in the book of Acts in verse 5 of chapter 1. For John truly baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then verse 8, and it says, but you, who? Those of you that have believed. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will. What power? Same power Jesus had. It's the same Holy Spirit. That, see, when you, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came in you. But the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And it's the same Holy Spirit that will come upon you 
that came upon Jesus when John baptized him in the River Jordan. It's not a different Holy Spirit. I don't know why we, we think, you know, well, when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, whoo, boom, all this power. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, you know, yeah, I get to speak in tongues once in a while. It's so much more than that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just about speaking in tongues. That's the initial sign of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that you'll receive power and will be able to manifest that power to a dark, dying world so that people will catch a glimpse of God's love and will come and make a decision to leave the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of the light of His Son. That's why the Holy Spirit comes upon us. That's the reason for it. And man, the early church got it. They got it, man. They, they, they started doing that. You see in, in Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter and John, they're going to the gate beautiful, and uh, there's a lame man that's been there for years. It's not just once. He, you know, this wasn't his first day there. He'd been there for years begging alms. And he asked Peter and John for money. He said, I don't have any money, but what I do have I'll give to you. And he said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And we see that, man, when he did, the crowd went wild. Just to paraphrase in modern-day English, whoa! Because the temple was packed every day, you know, with people. And they saw that, and they were like, oh, my God, what just happened? This lame man, that, that's, that's Bob. Bob's been like that for my whole life. And now he's jumping and running and shouting, and oh, my God, God healed me, God healed me, God healed me. And everybody was going crazy. And every, you know what happened? Their heart became open to hear what Peter had to say. Before that, not so much. But now, Peter started talking. They started to listen. And as a result, 5,000 men came to the Lord that day. 5,000 men. Over a single manifestation of the power of God. A single manifestation. It says this in Acts chapter 6, or Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Solomon's porch was part of the temple on the east side of the temple. It was like an alcove, a long alcove. And it says many, it was packed with people. And that's where the disciples would go, and they performed many signs and wonders <laughs> and none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And they brought their sick out in the streets and laid them in beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And as also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And I guarantee you, as they were all healed, they had everyone's attention. You see this. I'm not going to go on, but you see this all through the book of Acts. You see this all through Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And the book of Acts with Jesus, with his followers. And it wasn't just the 12 disciples. There was Stephen. There was Philip. There was others that were manifesting this power of God. And as a result, multitudes were coming to Jesus. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God hasn't come up with a different plan to reach the world. Boy, I've talked about that enough. But God hasn't come up with a different plan to reach the world. Same plan. Same plan. Then what's, where's the disconnect? Where's the disconnect with people? Have you ever wondered? I want to talk about the disconnect for a moment. And I'm going to, by proxy, uh, as a pastor... Take the blame for a lot of the disconnect. Let me explain that. When we talk as preachers that believe in the power of God, 
the healing power of God, people that win people to the Lord, people that walk in the, in the healing power of God. We talk about the Finneys uh, that wouldn't go to bed at night until he won somebody to the Lord. We'll talk about and lift up the Smith Wigglesworths. Uh, we'll talk about and lift up the John G. Lakes, the Oral Roberts, you know, the, these types of people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Praise God. Awesome men. But what happens is your average Christian, your average Christian is like, I'll never be able to do that. I'll never be able to walk in that kind of power. I, you know, that would take, my God, that would take me consecrating myself totally to, to that the prayer and, and the study of the word. And man, I'm married. I have kids. I have a career. I have a job. I can't give myself like the, the apostles totally to just reading the word and studying the word and praying. I got a life. So I'll never be able to do the things that they did. And so what happens is most Christians don't even start. And you know what? Valid point. Valid point. Can I say something? God's not calling you to quit your job, to leave your career, to ignore your family, to consecrate yourself to the preaching of the word and to just totally uh, praying and studying the word and, and being alone with God all the time so you can manifest forth the power of God. He's not calling you to do that. Now, there's some that he does, but the vast majority, he's not. He's not. So just unpack that burden. Just unpack it because you were never intended to pick it up and carry that. You say, well, what am I called to do? To know that that power is in you and upon you. To know that. And you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a prophet. You don't have to be an apostle. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be in the five-fold ministry to have that power working in you and through you. You don't have to, to quit and everything you're doing and just totally study that all the time. But you do need to, to be aware of that is in you. And then listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit because there's somebody that he wants you to reach with that power that is in you and upon you. You don't have to, you know, I'm going back to the 40s. You don't have to buy a tent and go around the country. Go to work. Go to your job. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And one day he might just drop a person, a family, somebody in your heart. He, you may see a co-worker, a friend, a family member that needs healed, needs the healing power of God. Maybe they've resisted God for the longest time. And he's saying, why don't, why don't you go lay hands on them? Why don't you go ahead and do that? And all he wants you to do is be obedient in that moment. Now notice, he didn't tell you, why don't you heal that person? He just said, go lay hands on them. That's what he told us in Mark 16 to do. You lay hands on the sick. It's your job to do that. It's his job to heal. He's looking for obedience. And you say, well, I don't know why we have some. I, I've done that before and, and nobody got healed. Well, you know, a lot of times we're running around laying hands on people that aren't ready. They don't have the faith for it. But if God, if the Holy Spirit will lead you, he's prepared you and he's prepared them for a moment. Now think about this. You're not going to be like Finney and not go to bed every night until you lead somebody to the Lord. 
I just got to go out. I, I got to win somebody to the Lord. I won't be able to sleep tonight. Yeah, that, that's not real. Okay, that's not real. It's not reality. That's not the reality I live in. It's not the reality you live in. And frankly, God never asked you to do that. Okay? Let me give you some numbers. I was thinking about this yesterday. And I thought, we got, we probably got a little over 100 people in this room. Between last night and this morning, with just a partial part of our crowd coming to church, easily 100 people. He's like 100 adults, 100 adults. If every adult that was here last night and, and, and this morning, say 100, 100, in the next year, through either preaching, or telling your story, teaching, ministering to them about a revelation that you had, or by the laying on of hands and manifesting the power of God to somebody, you caused one person to come out of the gross darkness of this world into the light of the kingdom of his son. One person, one person in 12 months. One person in a year. Now, I don't think that's just like, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Uh, you know, this is not somebody every night. This is one person in a year. One person. And you kind of took that person and taught them what you know about these things. And the next year, you won another one, and they won their first one. And this continues on in 10 years. Just, let's just say we start with 100 people in this church, and we did that. In 10 years... We've got 102,000 people saved. That's Saline County Plus. And see, this is something that's doable. Something that's doable. It's, it's not out of our reach, out of... That's 102,000 people. And then, you know, it's kind of like compound interest. You want to carry it out another two years? You've got over 105 million people saved. That's pretty incredible. See, God never gave us a plan that was unworkable. God, did, God didn't, in his word, say, now, all of you, quit your jobs, fast and pray, you know, at least 18 hours a day, and, and go out of here and win somebody and have healing meetings all over the world. He didn't tell you that. He just said, love me, love my word, love people, and when I move on you by my spirit, learn some things, get some understanding, and when I move on you, just act on it. it won't, I won't overwhelm you. I, I, I won't ask you to do something that you're not capable of doing. Man, change the world. We can change the world. We can change our, we can change our county. We can change our state. Just us. Just us in this room. We could do that. So here's my prayer. I'll close. Man, if you'd like to be a part of that, I can't lay hands on you right now. But just lift your hands up. Father, I'm asking you right now, by the help of the Holy Spirit, to put, we know these things. We, we do. Everybody in this room, this wasn't new to them. This was something we know. It's something we're aware of. It is. I'm asking you to put a boldness in us. A boldness in us. To act on the things that we know. Put a sensitivity in us. To when, you know, during the course of a month or, or so in that that, that, that prompting, that unction is there to minister to 
an individual, to minister to a family, that we were sensitive to hear about it, to hear your voice, and then act on it. And Father, that's our job. That's all you've asked us to do. That's what you said in Mark chapter 16. You just tell them it's up to them if they decide. <laughs> it's not on us to make people follow you, but it is, on, it is up to us to let the light that you've given us to shine through the gross darkness that has engulfed individual souls all around us. Whether it be telling our story, whether it be preaching, whether it be sharing scripture with them, or whether it be manifesting the power of God through the laying on of hands or operating in one of the gifts of the spirit, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, whatever it is, we do that, we obey that. And as a result, we're gonna change our county, gonna change our state, gonna change our nation, gonna help change the world. And we give you the praise for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.